Chapter 4 Into Terror Castle Bob had a good deal more of information in his notes about Terror Castle, and Jupiter read it all carefully. Pete kept saying wild horses couldn't drag him near the place, but when the time came to set out, he was ready. Dressed in some old clothes, he was carrying the portable tape recorder he had got from a boy in school by trading his stamp collection for it. Bob had a notebook and a couple of sharp pencils. Jupiter had his camera with the built-in flash. Both Pete and Bob had told their families they were going driving with Jupiter in the car he had won for 30 days. Their parents seemed to feel that, as long as Jupiter was with them, everything would be fine. And then, of course, they knew that Worthington, the chauffeur, went with the car. The big Rolls Royce with the huge old headlights came easing up to the Jones salvage yard as soon as it was dark, and they piled in. Jupiter had a map showing the location of Black Canyon. Worthington looked at it and said, Very good, Master Jones, and started off. As they were rolling along through the hills, all the twists and turns, Jupiter gave final instructions. This visit, he said, is just to get a first impression. But if we see anything unusual, I'll take a flashbulb picture of it. If we hear any sounds, you, Pete, capture them on your tape recorder. If I have to use this tape recorder, Pete said, as Worthington turned into a narrow road with steep hills on both sides, all you'll hear will be the sound of chattering teeth. You, Bob, Jupiter continued, will wait in the car for our return. That's the kind of job I like, Bob said. Golly, but it's dark along here. They were still climbing up a narrow, winding road without a house in sight anywhere. Whoever named it Black Canyon knew what he was doing, Pete said. We seem to have reached an obstruction, Jupiter observed. A mass of rocks and gravel blocked the road. The hills in that section of California, though sometimes covered thickly with mesquite and other bushes, had very little grass on them, so it was easy for rocks to roll down onto the road. Here, a rock slide seemed to have knocked down some crossbars which might have been put up once, long before, to bar passage. Worthington pulled the car off to one side. I fear we can proceed no farther, he reported but it is my impression from the map that the canyon should not extend more than a few hundred yards. That turn ahead. Thank you, Worthington. Come on, Pete. We'll walk the rest of the way. They climbed out. We'll be back in about an hour, Jupiter called to Worthington, who was manoeuvring the car to turn it. Golly, Pete Crenshaw said, an apprehensive note in his voice. That place looks scary. Jupiter, crouched beside him in the darkness, said nothing. He was intently surveying the scene ahead. At the far end of the dark, narrow canyon, the two boys could just make out the faint outlines of a fantastic structure. Against the starlit sky, a round, peaked tower stood out clearly. But with the exception of the tower, Terra Castle was almost invisible, placed as it was at the head of the narrow, rock-strewn canyon and built high against one wall, the castle-like building was enveloped in murky shadow. I think we ought to come by daylight, Pete suddenly suggested, so we can find our way around. Jupiter shook his head. Nothing ever happens here in the daytime, he said. It's only at night that this place scares people out of their wits. You're forgetting those men from the bank, Pete argued. And besides, I don't want to be scared out of my wits. I'm halfway there already. So am I. Jupiter admitted. I feel as if I had swallowed some butterflies. Then let's go back, Pete exclaimed with great relief. We've done enough for one night. We ought to go back to headquarters and make some more plans. I've already made my plans, his stocky companion said and stood up. My plans are to stay in Terra Castle for one hour tonight. He started up the road using a torch to pick his way through the rocks that had tumbled down from the steep canyon walls onto the cracked concrete. After a moment, Pete hurried after him. If I'd known it was going to be like this, he complained, I'd never have become an investigator. You'll feel better after we solve the mystery, Jupiter told him. Think of what a wonderful start it will give our investigation firm. But suppose we meet the ghost, or the blue phantom, or the mad spook, or whatever it is that haunts this place. 
the two boys peered through the murky darkness at the fantastic structure. That's exactly what I want. Jupiter slapped the compact flash camera which hung from his shoulder. If we can get its picture, we'll be famous. Suppose it gets us, Pete retorted. Shh, his stocky friend said. Stopping and snapping off his torch, Pete froze into silence and the darkness closed on them. Somebody or something was coming down the hillside directly towards them. Pete crouched down. Beside him, Jupe was swiftly getting his camera ready. The noise, a pattering of rock displaced by moving feet, was almost on them when Jupe's flashbulb lit up the night. In the sudden radiance of the flash, Pete saw two huge red eyes leaping directly at him. Then something furry scurried past, struck the concrete road and went bounding away. In its wake, several small rocks rolled down and came to rest at the boy's feet. A jackrabbit, Jupiter said. He sounded disappointed. We frightened it. We frightened it, Pete exclaimed. What do you think it did to me? The natural effect of mysterious sound and movement at night upon a susceptible nervous system, Jupiter said. Forward. He grabbed Pete's arm and pulled him along. We don't have to move quietly now. The flashbulb will have alerted the phantom if there is a phantom. Can we sing? Peter asked reluctantly falling into step beside him. If we sing row, row, row your boat, loudly enough we won't hear the spook moan and groan. There's no need to go to extremes, the other boy said firmly. We want to hear any moans and groans, also any screams, sighs, screeches or rattling of chains, all of which are supposed to be common manifestations of a supernatural presence. Pete suppressed the impulse to tell his partner that he had no desire whatever to hear any moans, groans, screams, screeches, sighs or rattling chains. He knew there was no point in it. When Jupiter made up his mind, he made up his mind. He was about as easy to move as a large rock. As they moved forward, the rambling old building loomed larger, gloomier and altogether less desirable. Pete tried hard to forget all the stories Bob had told them about the old place. After a last stretch along a high, crumbling stone wall, the boys entered the courtyard of Terra Castle. Here we are, Jupiter said, and stopped. One tower stretched skyward far above them. Another, shorter tower seemed to scowl down at them. Blank windows were blind eyes reflecting the starlight. Suddenly something flew around their heads. Pete ducked. Wow, he yelled. A bat. Bats only eat insects, Jupiter reminded him. They never eat people. Maybe this one wants a change of diet. Why take chances? Jupiter pointed to a wide doorway and the big car front door directly ahead. There is a door, he said. Now all we have to do is walk right through it. I wish I could get my legs to believe that. They think we ought to go back. So do mine, Jupiter admitted, but my legs take orders from me. Come on. He strode forward. Pete couldn't allow his partner to enter a place like Terra Castle alone, so he followed. They walked up the old marble steps and across a tiled terrace. As Jupiter was about to reach for the doorknob, Pete grabbed his arm. Wait, he said. Do you hear spooky music? Both boys listened. For a moment, they had the impression they heard a few weird notes, sounding as if they came from a million miles away. Then, in the darkness, they could hear only the night noises of insects and of a small stone or two rolling down the steep sides of the canyon. Probably just imagination, Jupiter said, though we did not sound too certain of it. Or possibly we heard a TV set playing over the ridge in the next canyon. Some trick of acoustics. Some trick all right, Pete muttered. What if it was the old ruined pipe organ being played by the Blue Phantom? Then we certainly want to hear it, Jupe said. Let us enter. He grasped the knob and pulled. With a long screech that curdled Pete's blood, it opened. Not waiting for their courage to evaporate, the two boys marched into a long dark hall, flashing their torches straight ahead. They passed open doorways full of shadows which seemed to breathe musty air at them. 
Then they came out into a large hallway with a ceiling two stories high. Jupiter stopped. We're here, he said. This is the main hall. We'll stay one hour, then we'll leave. Leave. A voice low and eerie whispered in their ears.